So this is not the most exciting lecture ever. It's actually something I think about a lot, but and something I always worried when I was a resident that they were going to ask on OCAPS, but they didn't really ask too many questions on this on OCAPS or on the, on the uh, boards, as I recall. But I remember reading those books and being totally daunted by a lot of these tests and questions and things. So um, a horopter is um, the space or the, the points and distance that fall exactly on the same part of the, uh, part of the fovea at the back of the eye. So you have to, your foveas have to be completely lined up uh, on the same image there to get, uh, you know, an, to get a, one binocular image. Um, uh, Panem's fusional area is a little bit bigger than, so a horopter is like the physical, it's, uh, it's more of a um, theoretical point in, or theoretical points uh, that line up, that you're, if you look at them, your foveas line up exactly the same. Panem's fusional area is a little bit bigger than that because when your eyes aren't perfectly lined up together, you can still see one image um, within Panem's fusional area. Um, and that's what gives you stereo too. So uh, is that the images are a little bit different. You know, if you look at something, it's a little bit different from one eye to the other eye. Um, but your eye, your brain can fuse it together and make it in stereo. So s the stereoscopic image uh, that you see, you can get that is a little bit bigger than fusional, than Panem's fusional area. So it's essentially the points in space that you can see that you can make into one image with both of your eyes working together. Um, this is kind of what I was talking about. Uh, so your brain is what puts it together, the, that binocular image. In a, you know, for a normal visual experience. They have to be similar in size and shape, which is something you think about in cataract surgery because you don't want to make somebody really anisometropic or you cannot, uh, you know, put that together, something we call anisoconia. Um, you know, what that is is a little bit different in each person, but a few diopters can really throw, you know, of somebody who hasn't been that way before can throw somebody off. Um, and that is worse when you're, you know, thinking about glasses or things. That's why we cannot put unilateral cataracts in glasses because the prescription would be too big in one eye. Uh, you know, you'd have to put a plus 15, plus 20 in one eye and that, if you looked out of that eye, the image would be bigger than this one. You can put a kid in that and they will learn to do it, but then they will have to be that for their whole life. So. Um, Fusion in areas near the fovea tolerates very little dissimilarity between the images. That means that, um, you know, that's because you've got your good 20-20 vision right there around the fovea. You can tolerate a little bit more in your peripheral vision because your vision isn't really as good. So you can pull those in together a little bit better than you can uh, something that's right center in the center of your vision. These are artificial subdivisions that they talk about in the, in the book. Uh, sensory fusion is uh, the topographical relationship between the retinas, um, kind of what we were talking about with Panem area, where images on corresponding retinal parts combine to form a uh, sim single image. So that's actually yeah, when you're lined up perfectly. Motor fusion is what your eyes do to attain fusion. So um, it's the, what we see when you put up a prism in front of your eye and you can start fusing to pull it in together. Your eyes want to work together, which is why strabismus surgery usually works. So we don't, it's not perfect. You know, we kind of do an about. Usually when we do strabismus surgery, move things back. And it usually works because usually if somebody is a fuser or if you can get them close to fusion, their eyes kind of lock it in. So if you, whereas, you know, some, when they're way off, it's a lot harder to do that. Uh, stereopsis is what we're talking. What I was talking about before. We test that with, um, you know, our, our, our binocular stereo vision, um, and, and yeah, it, it's a fine thing. You know, it's, your vision isn't that much different if you look out of one eye or versus the other eye. Uh, but um, and like I said, it's slightly wider than Panem's area, um, and adds a little bit of a unique quality to your vision. We test that using those, you know, those little books in clinic. Um, as you can see, how, how do they work? You can tell if you uh, look without the glasses. You know, the uh, number one, the the top on the top, is the one that pops out. If you look, you know, it's actually giving a little bit different image to your right eye versus your left eye, giving that sensation of, of stereopsis. 
And, and these tests in the book, they get progressively harder. You have to have good visual acuity in each eye, though, to have stereo. So it's sometimes a way to test uh, fakers in your clinic if they have stereo, which we see quite a few of the peds. Um, you have to have good vision in each eye to have good stereo. So, you know, you got to get all the way down to 40 seconds, the end of that uh, TITMIS testing. Um, you have to have 20 25 vision in each eye. Which is kind of what we were talking about before in terms of. Uh, you, you don't tolerate very much distance between, you know, difference between the two eyes uh, when you're talking about fusion, macular fusion. So if the vision is, the image is pretty blurry in one eye, you're just not going to be able to fuse that together. In Pete's clinic, sometimes we'll use a stereo test that's, uh, you know, you don't have to put the glasses on. This is called a um, laying uh, and have them pick these pictures. They're, it's harder to see these without the glasses, whereas, you know, you can kind of fake with these. If you have, don't have the glasses on, you can at least see the first three or four pretty clearly uh, without the glasses. Um, sometimes it can be a little better. Sometimes the kids are a little better, but it doesn't, it doesn't nearly test the same amount of acuity of uh, stereopsis, but in kids, you're often just looking for gross stereopsis anyway. What is gross stereopsis? That's, you know, pretty... Uh, you know, these test how good your stereopsis is, how fine it can get. The gross stereopsis is this fly. We want to look and see that they kind of pull it up. If they go straight for it, just touch the book, we say they fail. It's kind of hard in kids sometimes. Usually if they, if they scoop up the, the uh, wings of, this, of the fly, or if they really try to grab the top of the wings, we know that they can see it. But when they go right for it, and just grab at it. Because it, even if you can look, even with one eye, it does kind of give a funny image. It almost looks kind of like you're seeing in stereo, but you aren't truly. So sometimes that can be a little bit hard to tell on kids. But um, people with peripheral fusion who have a little bit of strabismus and not as great a stereo, yeah, we want to see if they have gross stereo. So we'll, we'll test this. Um, which is quite a bit different than that first circle, I think is 400 arc second or 800 arc seconds. So you're talking about 800 arc seconds versus 3000 arc seconds. Uh, the difference between their stereo from that first dot versus the, the fly. People are often worried if you don't have, you know, and binocularity is what we're trying to get with strabismus surgery, right? The earlier we operate, some studies say if you don't operate to fix strabismus before like three years old, you're never gonna get stereopsis. Um, those studies are kind of hard to do because you can't really separate out the kids who develop strabismus versus the one who never had strabismus. But um, this is what we're trying to get in kids when we do surgery early. And sometimes we get it and sometimes we don't. And people are always worried, well, will my kid have depth perception? Yeah, you'll still have depth perception because depth perception is not stereopsis. Um, after about 10 or 20 feet, most of your depth perception isn't, isn't is on monocular cues, so you're not even using stereopsis. Um, I always kind of wonder, like, I think probably the super elite athletes, like those tennis players and stuff, probably have super, super stereo. Like, they probably are able to see that spin, you know, and the baseball players and things like that. Uh, I think um, they probably have really, really good stereo. Um, maybe it's going to hold them back from being a, a, an elite athlete, but um, other than that, not having stereo, I don't think is going to hold you back much. Um, you know, there are lots of other things that we use to gauge depth perception, you know, object, object overlap, relative size, highlights and shadows, perspective. Um, you know, stereopsis is purely something we kind of test with those tests. Yeah, I think it, it does make it a little bit, it does improve your vision, but it's really only when you get kind of close. So not having stereopsis does not mean you're not going to have depth perception. Um, so much of your brain has uh, vision radiations running through it, so, you know, uh, any kid I see who has any neurologic problem is much more likely to have strabismus. I mean, your eyes are at the front of your brain and everything's uh, interpreted at the back. So, um, you know, and you learn about that, where, uh, uh, where the visual radiations run and it can tell us about strokes and, and insults to the brain and things. Um, the uh, optic radiations uh, des decusate at the chiasm and that's really essential for binocularity. People with albinism, you know, every, all the fibers cross, whereas, you know, most normal people, those nasal, just the nasal fibers cross. Um, that means people with albinism don't have normal binocularity. Um, 
but it's also the basis of the test that Creel does. He, you know, can do a VEP and see how uh, his response is different in, in albi and albinos, and that was really kind of the work that he did that got him on the map. But um, some kids that were wondering if they have albin uh, albinism, especially the one, because they can't sit in an OCT very well, A and B, they've gotten a stagmus, their OCT isn't that good, so we're you know, trying to look at their phobia to see, but we can shine a light and then record the electrical activity at the back, that's what a VEP is, and their response is different than, that, than, uh, than normal people. Um, so visual information from corresponding retinal area runs through the lateral geniculate body and is all interpreted at the back in the uh, visual cortex. This is in your book, but I never have seen a test question about it um, in my training. Those magnocellular cells within the lateral geniculate nucleus are represented with peripheral retina. They're more sensitive to moving stimuli and insensitive to color, whereas the parvocellular ones are pri primarily in the fovea. Uh, they tell more high-resolution information about uh, borders and color contrast and are important for seeing detail. The, uh, co the last cells there are less understood, maybe can help you see the color blue a little bit better. When you're born, your phobia is covered by multiple cell layers at birth, which is problematic when you send kids for VEPs when they're really young because they don't really have a normal phobia yet. Also, when you're looking in there, I fed uh, for albinism stuff, their phobias are not fully developed, but they develop pretty quickly. Um, the you know the photoreceptors then move around after birth and really uh, all the cones localized to that phobia area during the first two years of life. The white matter myelinates. Um, and the neurons in the lateral geniculate buclei increase in size um, until, in, you know, your brain and eyes keep developing until you're about 10. Um, you get an abnormal visual experience, abnormal binocularity, if you have visual deprivation to one or both eyes, anisometropia, strabismus. Um, in uh, monkey, they've done studies, you know, if you, if, so if you close one eye in adults or in monkeys, you know, things change and things grow and change. One thing that happens is that their eye starts growing more myopic. Sometimes we can tell that, you know, in kids that, that uh, with amblyopia, the, uh, you know, sometimes kids have a little bit of a cataract and we're wondering if uh, that's really visually significant or not. If you check their prescription and they're more myopic in that eye, it suggests that, that, that they are more amblyopic because of that. The other thing is that uh, the lateral geniculate nucleus will shrink a little bit on the side of the um, uh, decreased vision. Um, and that's what they're saying here on this bottom thing. So people have such a hard time with amblyopia. People, you know, they don't understand, you know, they'll say, well, I don't understand why they still can't see with the glasses. It's a brain problem. So what is amblyopia? It's, so, it's a decreased vision in one eye that we can't see anything that causes it. So we're assuming it's the brain. So they've actually done studies where they look at kittens or monkeys where they'll show so one eye shut and their lateral geniculate nucleus is thinner on one side. So your brain actually does not develop, even physically they can tell the size is different in an eye that is amblyopic. Um, and that's what it's saying here. That if, uh, you know, if you close one eye, one, the lateral geniculate nucleus will, will shrink and then the open eye starts growing into that area. Um, which is kind of interesting because that eye still is only 20-20, so it's not like it gets, it's like a bionic eye or anything, but it starts to occupy that, that space, but it's still thinner on the side of the amblyopic eye. So amblyopia is just that the brain does not interpret that information well, and we can actually see that. And the only way to fix it is to force the brain to work by uh, patching or, 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 or uh, penalizing the good eye. Um, yeah, they've shown that you know blood flow and glucose is lower during stimulation of the amblyopic eye. It's just not wired as well. And the only way to wire it better is to catch it early and, and, and force it to work. Um, and, and that's why binocularity is not that as good in those kids with amblyopia, because those binocular centers in, within the lateral geniculate nucleus just don't form as well. Uh, the critical period is that period where you want to catch people, catch kids, where you can actually reverse amblyopia. Um, you know, in the studies they've done, it's where they can unsuture that eyelid to make make uh, make the vision better. Um, and after that, after that critical period, if they you know treat that or reverse the occlusion, they cannot make those columns within the, the lateral geniculate nucleus re-expand. 
So yeah, so this is, that is what amblyopia is. It's reduced vision caused by a bad brain because the brain hasn't learned how to see. You have to learn how to see, and so if one eye's closed, you're just not gonna learn how to do it. Um, and when you have that, you're much more likely to develop strabismus. Um, but uh, strabismus is something that can cause it, anisometropia that can, can cause it, uh, much more farsighted than nearsighted, and high um, bilateral refractive errors, so uh, bilateral amblyopia, or what they say, amatropia. Uh, why, does am why is amblyopia caused by anisometropia, or, or sorry, it can be caused by optical defocus, that can be from anisometropia. Um, if you have amblyopia for anisometropia, meaning that your eyes are just two different shapes, so kids with hyperopia, if they're nothing in this eye and a plus three in this eye, if they you know, are just looking far into distance, they're just gonna focus this eye and leave this eye three diopters unfocused. So um, that is why they develop amblyopia, just because this eye is always blurry. If you cover this eye, they will focus it, but they're not doing that normally, so their brain just isn't usually using that. So. Um, if they do have amblyopia from optical defocus, it's much easier to treat than strabismus. If you just put glasses on these kids, most of them will fix with just the glasses. And even up to like age 13, they've showed in, up in like in pedic studies that they can get better. Um, it doesn't usually develop during the first year of life, may not develop until they're a little later. Whereas strabismus is much harder to treat. Um, why is that? Because their phobias aren't lined up. Uh, it's also because of optical defocus. They're not focusing that eye to make it clear. If they're, if they're turned a little bit in the right eye, they're looking with this eye. This eye is just not even going to focus. They just kind of, they have am abnormal accommodation usually, uh, which develops over time because they're not using it. Um, this develops earlier, is much harder to treat. Um, you know, if you do have uh, strabismus, your brain adapts to get rid of that second image. So it's an adaptation thing that's good, but it's bad because you start to lose vision. So your brain just turns off one eye. Um, patients with strabismus who develop the strabismus early and have normal retinal correspondence, meaning their brain is wired so that the retina should line up together, uh, they, they learn to just suppress or turn off one image. Um, it can be facultative, meaning you, um, what does that mean? That means, it's, it's not all the time. Um, yeah, they, they don't always have, um, they don't always have, they are not always suppressing. So yeah, like an XT, uh, you know, they're often using their eyes, sometimes it will turn out. Um, so they're not suppressing 100% of the time, they have that in there, but when they're, uh, it's only, it's only, happening when that eye is drifted out. How do we treat it? We put them in glasses, we treat their amblyopia with patching or atropine, and we try to align them as early as we can with strabismus if, if, uh, if glasses don't work. Um, can be a little bit troubled, hard in, in people who fuse, which is why strabismus surgery doesn't work as well in them, because we just get them close and they don't pull, put in that fusion. Um, Uh, anomalous retinal correspondence means that just the way their brain is wired is in with the fovea of one eye lined up with not the fovea of the other eye. Um, uh, it, it's an adaptation in people who have strabismus to get some amount of binocularity. Um, sometimes these people, you know, and this is kind of what they like, you know, can't ask about in tests and things. Sometimes after surgery, if you get them straight, uh, they will still have strabismus because even though straight is normal for most people, it is not normal for them because their fovea in one eye and their pseudophobia in the other eye are not lined up. But um, if they have, and I've only had this happen once and the kid had diplopia for like six months and then it went away, but um, yes, it usually goes away. These are the really confusing tests that you read about in the books. I've never actually had a question on these, but um, a red glass test, uh, in a harmonious, in a person who has harmonious uh, anomalous retinal correspondence with an esotropia, you can see in that right picture that their phobia is lined up with their P, their pseudophobia. So in a normal person, their phobias would be lined up. In this person, their right eyes crossed, so their brain has learned that, or has adapted so that they're trying to get some amount of binocularity when their um, uh, phobia is lined up with their pseudophobia. Phobia. And that is why when they look at that red light, they blend that red light in the right eye with the left eye and it becomes a pink light. Um, 
Whereas when you co fully correct their esotropy and put the image on the true fovea, they see diplopia. Unlike non-harmonious, where they, um, uh, they kind of have that pseudo-fusion or, or just that very peripheral fusion when you, uh, get, when you correct a little bit of the esotropia. When you correct all of the esotropia, they get diplopia. When you correct some of the esotropia, they can kind of fuse it. But um, walking around, they either have diplopia um, or they have suppressed the image. Whoopsie. Um, so with this red filter test in somebody who has NRC or normal retinal correspondence, if they have an exotropy, they have cross diplopia, where, you know, and that's where they put a red filter in front of one eye and, and have them uh, tell you where, they, where the red image is or where the red light is, um, whereas somebody with esotropia is going to have an uncrossed diplopia. Um, Worth four dot testing is something I do quite a bit, um, just trying to figure out what people's visual experience is. It's kind of hard in kids sometimes. Um, you, you put the red lens over the right eye, the green lens over the, red, the left eye, the right eye sees two reds, the left eye sees three greens, but if they're fusing together, they should see four lights. Um, uh, it can be hard in people who are alternately fusing because they'll say, I see two, or in people who can kind of alternately fuse. But in general, yeah, that's the classic teaching. Two, you know, if they see two or three, they're suppressing one of the eyes, and it depends on which way you put those glasses on. Um, if you see four together, um, you, uh, um, if you see four together, they're fusing. You can also use the same crossed or uncrossed. You know, if, the Im if they're seeing the, the lights crossed this way, they have an XT. If they're, you know, uncrossed, then they have an ET in there. Sometimes when people's eyes look straight, yeah, they're, they're having some kind of funky thing going on or you can't really figure out if they can't use their eyes together, so it can, it can be really helpful to use this. Um, they're seeing five lights, yeah, they've got either double vision or they're alternately suppressing. So it's like if they're ET and they're looking out of this eye, they're going to see the two red, but then if they flip behind the glasses, they're going to tell you to see that. So they don't necessarily always have diplopia if they see the five lights, only if they see them all together, but sometimes they'll say three, two, three, two. Um, Monofixation is uh, when, um, when people have some amount of peripheral fusion, it's kind of uh, when they have a little bit of strabismus and they're trying to get some amount of binocularity. These people will suppress at distance, so they'll say, oh, I see two rights when you're looking far away, and then when they come up close, they see four. This can be, is that my next slide? Um, these are people who have peripheral fusion with the central scotoma. Uh, so these are the people who come in and they're like 20-40 in one eye and 20-20 in the other eye and you can't figure out why and you dilate them and they've got the same prescription between the two eyes. Um, and you do a cross cover test and you can't see anything and then, um, yeah, they, they either have a very small um, misalignment that you can't see or they've had some kind of anisotropia that's resolved by itself. These people have stereo, you know, that's why they have the monofixation syndrome, but it's usually reduced. It's not normal. So, you know, they can maybe see a couple of the dots popping up and they can maybe see the um, uh, fly, but they cannot get all the way down. Amblyopia is common. They usually have a little bit and more of that is because their eyes are not lined up. Um, and this can be a little harder. It's harder to treat usually than the, uh, anything with anisometropia. Um, they say that this is a good outcome of somebody with congenital esotropia. So somebody who's born with their eyes crossed, their brain doesn't really use their eyes together. You're trying to get it there. If you do strabismus surgery and you get monofixation, you should say you have a good success. Um, yeah, these are Bagalini lenses. Bob likes to use these, but yeah, they can... Um, uh, you can interpret their crossed and uncrossed diplopia. You can also look at torsion that way, bless you. They're lined up, so one is at 135 degrees and one's at 45 degrees on the eye. Um, somebody, you know, if you're looking together and they have orthotropia, they're straight, they should have a nice X. If they're suppressing their right eye, you're not going to see that. You know, you're not going to, oh, sorry, if they're suppressing their left eye, you're not going to see this one going this way, so you're only going to see this one. They have a little, I think this would be pretty hard for somebody to say, but it's missing in the middle. Um, I don't usually use these lenses, but uh, you should know about them. If they have um, esotropia, you know, they have uncrossed diplopia, right? So this right eye is going to be shifted this way. 
um, uh, and then you're going to see it as a V, whereas if they have exotropia, it's going to be shifted this way because they have cross diplopia, um, and then you're going to see it as a V. In theory, that's what this says. Um, yeah, and this is just explaining it. You can you can label the fovea um, and have them look at the after images. Um, oh, this is another similar test. It's kind of the same thing. I've never done this one either. Um, but you kind of label the label the eye with a flash of light, and then uh, same kind of thing. If it's uh, uh, you know if they have normal retinal correspondence. They're going to see them together. If they have anomalous retinal correspondence, they're going to see them as a T or a backwards T, flip T. Sometimes on the oral boards, they like to ask weird questions like, what is this device? I've never actually seen one of these. Um, but it is called an amblyoscope. Um, and it's somebody can sit in there and kind of dial in exactly what they have. So it would be a way of telling exactly how much um, in primary gaze pretty much just, just primary gaze. How much esotropia they have, how much hypertropia they have, and how much torsion they have. And they could you, then you could just read it out from a calibrated scale. So um, it's good for people with, uh, who were binocular at one point and then for some reason were not, because now they're getting double vision and um, try to figure out how to make them straight again. It can be really helpful for figuring out exactly how much torsion they have, because sometimes that can be a little bit difficult to assess. Um, you can use it for exercises to try to kind of get people to fuse a little bit better to overcome suppression and can increase their fusional amplitudes. I don't think anybody really does that though. It's just kind of an old school machine, but they do sometimes ask those weird questions on boards. What is this? Um, my computer's frozen. This is what's called a Lancaster red green test, whoops, where they, um, I prefer to use these. I prefer to use a double Maddox rod to tell what torsion is. You put, you know, two lenses over the eye, shine, you know, two double Maddox rod, two Maddox rods over each eye, shine a light with a Femhoff, and then, you know, they should see two lines, one red, one, one. I usually do one red and one uh, white, but you don't have to. Um, and then you try to get them to move the little dials to. I usually make them parallel with the ground and parallel with each other. Sometimes they'll start fusing them, and if you want to, you can throw a prism in there so that they can easily see that they are um, uh, parallel to each other. Um, somebody who has um, different uh, alignment in uh, different fields of gaze, uh, you can test their torsion. These are ways to, to measure torsion. Uh, you can measure with this what we call the Lancaster red green test, which is this test here where you wear these glasses and then the examiner shines a light and then the person shines their light and they try to and they make them take they make them overlap with each other so it can be useful for figuring out things like uh, fourth nerve palsy um, where uh, they're uh, or just any kind of incombinate strabismus where it's different in one field of gaze Let's see. Yeah, here's somebody with bilateral superior oblique palsy. You can see that they're not as missile. This is primary gaze, but when you go into down gaze, they start getting more torted and more esotropic. So after all that really fun stuff that um, you don't like to think about unless you do it all the time, um, Shrav was nice enough to put together some questions, because that's how you guys want to do these lectures now, um, which is great. Um, We can go over these questions together. So, which of the following essentially rules out a diagnosis of monofixation syndrome? So we talked about monofixation syndrome. It's just people who are trying to get some amount of binocularity when they have either um, anisometropia or like a small angle strabismus. So they are peripherally fusing because that, that is what, you know, they have a, some kind of scotoma there, but they have peripheral fusion um, that uh, they have biomacular fusion. They do not have biomacular fusion. So they, so they do have peripheral fusion, yes. They do have absence of biomacular fusion. Why is that? Um, because their macula, their phobias are not lined up. They are, their phobias are not lined up uh, uh, physically, and so they're trying to get some amount of binocularity with what they've got. So they do have that. Two lights seen on distance worth four dot test. That just means they're suppressing. 
So yes, they do have that usually um, because they are suppressing most of the time. They, they have a little suppression scotoma, they have peripheral fusion, um, and they uh, suppress on Worth 4 dot. Do they have 60 seconds of arc stereo? No, they don't. They don't usually have that much stereo. They have about 200 or so. So um, they can see the fly, they might see the first or second or third uh, uh, circle, but they aren't going to see much more than that. And that's what this all says. Um, oh, she said 59 minutes. Well, yeah. Uh, with the fly, yeah, you're just looking for gross spherioctaves. Kids are not always great at these tests, but you'd be surprised. Some of them are pretty good. Um, but the superior oblique insertion forms 51 degrees with the visual axis. What is the primate action of superior oblique? So what's, why do we have a superior oblique and why is it controlled by its own nerve? It's mostly to twist your eyes. So it works mostly if you, um, you know, tilt your head to the side, it will rotate your eye back the other way. So it's, it's an, it's a, it's a um, evolutionary uh, development. And I think it's more, they think like, something to do with like fish or being buoyant and things. Your eyes kind of always want to come up. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so if you tilt your head this way, you know, it's twisting, it, it's working most in this eye. So it's twisting your eye back to keep them that way, which is why somebody with a superior oblique palsy is going to tilt this way. But if you tilt them this way, that eye is going to go crazy up this way because it's not turning in and it's not pulling down to make them right. So. Um, uh, you could just think of the superior oblique mostly as an intorter. It's, that's its main function, which is why if you wipe it out, you look at somebody, if somebody comes in with a bilateral superior oblique palsy, it can be kind of, you know, it's usually after trauma, and you'll look at them and they look dead on straight in all fields of gaze, but they tell you they're miserable. Um, but then when you look at, like do a Lancaster red-green, you'll see that they've got crazy torsion and down gaze. So they just can't fuse that torsion because that's the main purpose of the, of the superior oblique is just to torque it. And it works more in down gaze. So the superior oblique works when you're, it pulls your eye down and in so, um, and twists it. So mostly twists, pulls your eye down and in. Um, so what is the main action of it? It's, a, it's, a, it's an intorter. If it's in extreme adduction, I mean, that's where you look at the obliques is when your eye's looking at your nose. If it's going too high up, your inferior is working too hard. If it's going too far down, your superior is working too hard. So when you're looking this way, it, it pulls your eye down. Um, and what does it do in abduction? It's still a torter. So that's kind of what this says. So yeah, it's got that funny angle, but I think it's easiest just to think about the superior oblique. If you're looking to the side and your eye's going too far down, the superior is overacting. If it's looking too far up, it's uh, overacting. So what is its, its what is its role? It's mostly a torter, because that's why you get so bad with uh, somebody who has a palsy of it, but it also pulls the eye down, and you can see that if you look in and down. <laughs> Thinking about it this way is like too confusing for me. I mean, I can't think about it that way, but I don't really. I think about it more like if I'm looking at somebody's versions and I'm looking around and I'm wondering what I what muscles overacting. Yeah, I'm looking how the eye moves when it goes in towards the nose if it's too far down. And you don't see superior oblique overaction very often, but you see inferior oblique overaction all the time, right? If you look this way and the eyes go crazy up that way. Um, I haven't looked at these. What are we on time? Are we close? Should we watch this, Shrub, or not? Yeah, uh, it's up to you. You guys can watch it on your own time. I just thought it was easier for me to visualize it with the video than I can watch it. Me. We'll see what it says. Because this is so exciting. <laughs> Hi. Understanding the actions oh, of the extraocular muscles can be frustratingly confusing, so I hope this video helps. Like you may also want to watch a video on eye like movement one. terminology. Which one? At what? 158. to 23 degrees, the superior and inferior recti are aligned with the axis of the eye. They therefore act purely to elevate and depress the abducted eye. The superior oblique acts to entort and the inferior oblique acts to extort the abducted eye. When the eye is abducted, the inferior oblique and superior oblique become the main elevators and depressors. 
the superior rectus now primarily intorts and inferior rectus primarily extorts. How can you remember these eye movements? Well, I draw a simple diagram. This diagram shows the abducted eye due to lateral rectus with elevation from superior rectus and depression from inferior rectus. It also shows adduction from medial so rectus this is what I think about, with elevation from inferior oblique inferior and depression from superior oblique. Finally, for the intorsion and extorsion, simply turn the eyebrows into arrows. You don't have to remember all those lined up with this axis, this axis. axis. I don't and even remember them intorsion. ever asking questions like that. I think it's, it's just more important to just realize if they're lined up with their whatever angle, when they're in pure whatever, it's always going to be the same. It's not like it's an abductor in one gaze and an adductor in the other gaze. Yeah, the superior oblique is, a, is an intorter. It pulls the eye down. Um, yeah, and add a, it, uh, so the inferior oblique as an elevator is best seen in adduction. So we look at both of them in adduction. You are contemplating bilateral medial rectus recessions on a 45-year-old with long-standing ET. During the course of your preoperative exam, you determine that he has anomalous retinal correspondence. What does that mean? It means that you measure 40 on their, uh, with their alternate prism <coughs> cover test, but when you put up 40, they're diplopic. If you put up something else and they're not diplopic, yeah, then that means that they've got anomalous retinal correspondence. So, um, uh, which of the following may happen shortly after your surgery? Well, you're going to operate for that what you got on the APCT, but after they have they have uh, um, so you've corrected all their esotropia. You look at them and now they're straight, but they're telling you they see double vision. So, what kind of double are they going to see if they're if they were ET and now you've made them straight, but they're feeling like they're XT? Are they going to have singular binocular vision? No. Are they going to have monocular diplopia? No. Are they going to have uncrossed diplopia? No. Well, if they're XT now, they're going to have crossed diplopia. XTs are crossed and ETs are uncrossed. So this is just saying, yeah, if now if you've made them ET and they're, if they were ET and now you've made them what you think is straight, but their brain is wired to not be straight if you've overdone them now, they're going to be XT. So they're going to have paradoxical diplopia. I've only had this happen in one person, and he was an albino, and he was really XT. He, one of, somebody else had operated on him before, and he was really XT. He had like a 40 to 50 XT, so I fixed him. But then on alternate prism cover test, he was still XT, but he was diplopic. But then I could never get rid of his apopia if I put up the prism and things. But after about, and then I said, well, I can put your eye back where it was. And he's like, yes. And the dad's like, no. <laughs> uh, but even when I put him back in, is like 40, he still couldn't fuse it. So he had some kind of altered binocular, but it did go away eventually. He was. Does that make sense? I didn't understand what crossed and uncrossed meant. Oh, it just means if you're like, it's what you could see with the worth four dot. So if you have, like, if you're seeing two lights with your red eye and three lights with your, and you're trying to figure out if, you know, with the worth four dot or a Maddox rods or whatever. So you're seeing these, you're seeing two lights with the red eye, right eye, and you're seeing three with your left eye with the green. And if you're, you're trying to figure out if they're crossed or they're uncrossed. So if they're exotropic, their eyes, yeah, and this tells you well. If you're, yeah, so if you're exotropic, your eyes turn outward, so your fovea is inward, and then light coming from straight ahead is falling on the, te on the temporal side, but you're going to see it over here, which is why if you're XT, you're actually going to see your images crossed. It's confusing. It's the same thing like everything's upside down and backwards. And that's it. <laughs>